All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Chip, can you see the screen and can you hear me? I can see the screen and hear you. Outstanding. Okay, uh, just on behalf of my co-authors, we're really excited to um, inform you guys about some work we've been doing on this this topic and uh, how we've been engaging a, a citizen science approach to this, um, which, as you'll see, is, is essential for this to you know really take form. And I just want to recognize a few people here. Uh, Mike McAllister, uh, who's a research coordinator in our lab, and uh, he's been the boots on the ground for a lot of this project. Uh, Lauren Brewster, who is a postdoc in our lab, uh, she's recently moved to UMass Dartmouth, uh, but did a lot of work putting the surveys together. Uh, TJ Ossendorf, who's a research uh, technician in our lab, and he's really taken over with some of the cooperative surveys. Um, Cliff Hutt, who I think is on, uh, he's from NOAA Fisheries. He's our NOAA partner in this project, and he's been really been helping us with the social science aspect of this. And of course, Marcus, who's uh, kind of been uh, barking about this um, this issue and how it needs research attention in the United States for some time. So uh, he's really spearheaded a lot of this initial efforts. And Marcus and I will both be available in the Q and A session uh, for everybody. So <clears throat> depredation. If you're not familiar with this, this is the partial or complete removal of a target species caught by a fishing gear by a non-target species. So you know, a lot of what we'll be talking about today is, is sort of this uh, interaction here where somebody might be fishing for something like red snapper and a, a shark comes up and, and bites it in half or um, makes it unusable. And uh, you know, as far as research goes with depredation, it's historically focused, at least in the United States, um, on interactions in commercial fisheries, particularly uh, long lines and uh, interactions with marine mammals and things like that. But there's been a, a, a shift towards uh, trying to understand this in recreational hook and line fisheries, uh, which are purportedly you know, being adversely affected uh, by a lot of these negative um, interactions we see here. And uh, a lot of people ask the question, why? Why all of a sudden um, do we uh, seem to be having more depredation? Well, one hypothesis is that, uh, first of all, there's, there's more fishing than there ever has been. Uh, here's some graphs here just kind of showing you the number of um, anglers reported. Uh, as you can see, there's been a steady increase in that over the years. Uh, but also concomitant with that is, has been some of the first signs of recovery of uh, shark abundance uh, that we're seeing um, in some, uh, some stocks here. So, you know, a few years ago, John Carlson, who works with NOAA Fisheries, put together a great paper saying, are we ready for elasmobranch or shark and ray conservation success. And one of the potential consequences of this that was discussed was uh, these potential uh, negative interactions. And this has become a, a very hot topic, um, particularly in Florida. Um, and it's been somewhat polarizing as well. We've, we've got, you know, a lot of groups uh, interested in this and, um, you know, advocating one way or another, depending on their, um, you know, uh, what their industry is. And, you know, some of this is being linked to other types of interactions, not just shark depredation, but also uh, shark bites or negative, you know, interactions all the way up to New York. So uh, this this has become a very, um, very hot button item. Locally here in Florida, it's, uh, you know, been probably at the forefront uh, of the news compared to the rest of the United States. Uh, and has led to a controversial uh, tournament uh, that was uh, held uh, this past summer, which is, you know, kind of manifestation of, you know, this sort of um, uh, perception of, of where sharks fit in the ecosystem and how damaging they, they're being to some of these uh, individuals who uh, make their livelihoods on the water. And it's not just the, uh, the stakeholders and particularly the fishermen, us scientists are seeing this too. So, you know, this was a, a, a short little video clip of a uh, vertical line survey we were doing in the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see uh, it was targeting red snapper. And you know, here are some sandbar sharks that come up and kind of uh, tear these fish uh, right off the hooks. And and this paper, which we published in 2018, which was you know honestly a gear uh, oriented paper, uh, but also gave us some of our first insights into you know what sort of rates um, catch was getting depredated in the Gulf of Mexico. 
And there have since been other studies that have shown these types of interactions. And uh, in that paper, we basically showed, you know, 14% of the time we're getting these um, fish bitten off these hooks by, uh, by sandbar sharks. And that was mainly off of Texas. And that sort of trends a little bit with what we're seeing in the commercial fishery. So this was a, a, a graph from a um, HMS advisory panel meeting a few years ago, which is showing uh, shark depredation expressed as proportion of sets with shark depredation uh, over you know about a 15 year cycle here. And when you can see here, while the uh, proportion of sets is relatively low, so this would be you know, about two and a half percent up to seven and a half percent. There is a trend that this is increasing in this uh, in the commercial fisheries and particularly in uh, peninsular Florida, which is the um, track here shown in red. So the evidence exists in uh, commercial fisheries and we've got great data for that. But as many of you know, tracking this through recreational fisheries through time is, is a bit more challenging. and. Uh, not to say that's not just as important because particularly in the Southeast, uh, this is a multi-billion dollar industry and uh, it is complex, however, and involves multiple sectors uh, such as the private recreational folks, as well as those from the fire charter segment as well. So uh, getting to these individuals and um, acquiring this information, um, you know, can be uh, a bit arduous. But as you know, these individuals can uh, be very important and um, particularly for, you know, helping us scientists get out and, and um, sample uh, larger spaces and larger uh, windows. Uh, and this is no, you know, nothing new to NOAA, at least, you know, there's plenty of programs out there where uh, they've been able to leverage uh, citizen science approaches you know, from anything from whale watching to tracking uh, marine debris and that kind of thing, you know, why couldn't we do this for uh, monitoring shark depredation? And this is really important as well because this type of approach has been demonstrated to foster trust and buy-in and those results by the stakeholders. And of course, it fosters a lot of engagement. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, somewhat of a well-demonstrated approach to uh, tackling these types of problems that are affecting these stakeholders. And we have you know, pretty good proof of concept. So there's actually a, a study that came out just this year um, by Grace Castleberry, who's a, a finishing PhD student up at UMass. And uh, she works in Andy Dalchuk's lab. And they uh, put out this paper, When Fishing Bites, Understanding Angular Responses to Shark Depredation. It's a really good paper. I highly suggest reading it. Um, and this was sort of on a, on a national level trying to uh, get a gauge of what anglers are experiencing in terms of depredation. Um, and they actually found quite a bit of this out there and um, people being the most affected, uh, particularly fishing guides. So those people who are uh, on the water all the time. And another thing that came out of this, as you can see in the lower map from uh, this figure is, is Florida's really uh, emerged, uh, at least based on their survey as, as uh, a hot spot for this. And actually, this prompted uh, the FWC to do a, a predator interaction survey, uh, which they completed last year, uh, confirming much of these uh, types of trends. Um, but for us, we're really interested in, in depredation, particularly in recreational fisheries. So if you can use the analogy of us being kind of these detectives and uh, approaching these crime scenes of, of shark depredations, you know, what we really want to know is who are the victims here? So what species are actually being depredated upon? Who are the culprits? So, uh, you know, what are the species of depredators? And at what rates uh, are they uh, potentially damaging uh, these, these, these fish? And uh, the last part is sort of understanding the scene of the crime. So what are the environmental conditions that are fostering these depredation rates? Are there differences by season or, um, you know, that kind of stuff, space, where you are in, in Florida or elsewhere. So um, that was our first goal to kind of characterize depredation. And a second goal of our project has been to evaluate uh, fishermen perceptions. Um, you know, so what, what, how do fishermen uh, perceive depredation to be trending? Is it going up, going down? Uh, who are the key species? Uh, what types of factors do they think um, 
uh, facilitate these interactions and things that we haven't thought of uh, as well. And uh, what are the effects on their fishing practices or fishing motivation? So do, do they stop fishing? Um, do they change where they fish? These, all these types of things have, have yet to be captured. So we took a, a stab at that. And then uh, using all that, trying to understand uh, their stance on shark management. So our approach, you know, engage a citizen science um, method to look at shark depredation. And we've been focusing mainly on recreational hook and line fisheries in Florida. And we've, we've done this with three major methods, uh, a social media analysis, um, angler surveys, but that are uh, a bit more targeted uh, to the environment. And then a genetic analysis where we're kind of uh, doing a bit of forensics, uh, where we're going out and working with the fishermen, training the captains to swab fish for remnant DNA so we can better identify uh, the depredators. So we'll talk about the social media analysis first. Um, and this was a uh, page on Facebook called Sportsman Fighting for Marine Balance. It was something that was initiated uh, by an old partner of ours, uh, Captain Pat Price, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, uh, his page, however, has lived on. We've had some you know, great communication with the um, uh, folks who are running this now, and this group has actually exceeded uh, this amount now. So it's over 6,000 members, and uh, what these uh, individuals like to do is, is post pictures of, of these depredation uh, incidents. And uh, we can use that, uh, you know, to do something called content analysis uh, to understand, you know, what species are being depredated. And then if there's available context, uh, you know, messages about where this was or what they were, you know, um, what kind of gear they're using, we can also evaluate maybe where this is happening and when. So we've, we've to date gone through, um, over about two years of posts, uh, which are about 654 uh, original posts. And uh, to no surprise, you know, sharks have been the most frequently implicated uh, depredator. Um, it is important to show, though, that uh, oftentimes the shark is not seen, uh, which makes sense because a lot of these interactions happen at depth. It depends on uh, how, the, how the fishermen are, are, you know, whether fishing a pelagic or, or on bottom. Uh, bull sharks uh, have emerged as you know the most uh, commonly reported species that's depredating catch, and uh, the catch is comprised 68 different species. And these are just this is just a smattering of sort of the top 10. So you can see uh, red snappers up there, and really 80% of the depredations comprise uh, three complexes: snapper grouper. Um, highly migratory species, as well as coastal migratory pelagics. So, uh, and again, these are just sort of uh, example pictures uh, of, of things people have posted. So uh, the coastal migratory pelagics is, is very much dominated by uh, kingfish, uh, or also known as king mackerel. So uh, that's that's been a, a highly reported uh, species uh, getting, getting bitten. So that information has been really useful to us. and providing context. Um, we also distributed these um, surveys uh, for anglers to fill out to get a better gauge on um, not only the depredation rates across various sectors, but also um, you know, how, what type of perceptions these individuals have. So you know, these are just little screenshots of our survey that we uh, distributed um, uh, three, or excuse me, four times over the course of the past year. So uh, every three months we were doing this to try and capture uh, different fishing practices, uh, different types of um, you know, species being targeted and so on and so forth. So uh, today we've analyzed three rounds of these uh, surveys. Um, we've had um, about 1,700 responses and a, a very high acceptance rate. So you know, just over 2% of the folks who were surveyed uh, you know, decided not to choose the survey. Uh, a large majority of these individuals were recreational fishermen. This was done using the FWC license database. Um, and uh, over half of these people uh, on average experienced depredation. So in terms of uh, that proportion of catch they're experiencing as depredated, you can see the numbers are 
are fairly all over the place. So these bars um, really show you the number of individuals um, experiencing depredation by different proportions. So this bar over here, these are you know 20 or so individuals that are reporting 100% depredation on their um, most recent trip. Uh, but this dotted line kind of shows you the average across the board um, for the, the past uh, three rounds of surveys we've looked at. So it, it's it's quite variable, but on average, uh, we're seeing you know just shy of 40% um, depredation rates. Now, if you break this up by sector, we had an opportunity to do that. You can see by charter for hire, uh, commercial and headboat, which you know you can see a lot less reporting here. Uh, or you know, these are volunteer voluntary reports. Keep that in mind. So, um, and then we do have some individuals who gave us input from uh, shore or pier recreational fishermen, uh, but primarily a lot of our work has been coming from uh, the recreational uh, folks who are angling for boats. So this this graph here very much reflects you know the overall that you saw earlier. So uh, just to show you that you know we are somewhat biased in the survey, but that was the type of data that. NOAA Fisheries was was really interested in because this has been uh, very underrepresented uh, in the past. We also took a look at this by uh, region. So this is showing you across Florida. So we broke this up into the Florida Keys, Southeast, uh, Western Panhandle, Southwest Florida, Northeast Florida, and Big Bend. Uh, and these numbers here show you the number of uh, responses uh, for each of these. And then what we've done is we've categorized uh, the primary target species, uh, right? So target species really is a target complex. Um, so we, we were a little creative here uh, because we did have some you know, interesting uh, groupings, but what you can see is a lot of these blue bars tend to be, uh, you know, people who have experienced depredation tend to be fishing for a snapper grouper primarily in the Florida Keys, but you can also see a large majority of these individuals are also uh, fishing for dolphin, wahoo, and blackfin. Uh, that's not a true management uh, segment, I know, but um, uh, partially does uh, kind of align with the fishery techniques and styles. Uh, you also see uh, these yellow bars, in particular off of um, Southeast Florida. Uh, these are the pelagic, so uh, primarily billfish, shellfish, uh, that are highly migratory species, so managed by the HMS group and uh, quite a bit there. And then as you move through um, other parts of Florida, you see larger dominance from the inshore uh, sport fishing groups. So things like snook and trout and that kind of stuff. But so this this kind of reflects um, a lot of the just fishing practices in these different areas. As you guys know, you know, depending on where you are in Florida, particularly the Atlantic versus the Gulf, the shelf is, you know, different distances away. And that also changes as you move from South Florida uh, on the Atlantic coast to the North Florida. So these things can reflect um, many differences in fishing behavior as well. But it was a good way for us to kind of get a sense of, you know, um, by primary target complex, uh, how are people experiencing depredation? So for snapper grouper, you know, these are the main species being reported as you move throughout the state in those various regions I was just telling you about. Uh, and again, to no surprise, you know, you see quite a bit of Red Snapper, both the Western Panhandle, a bit of the Big Bend in the Northeast area. And as you move uh, south through the um, state, uh, where things, you know, to uh, bottom uh, bathymetry and, and also temperatures change a bit, uh, you're seeing some more of the tropical species come into the mix. So mutton snappers are uh, more popular, um, being reported as depredated in the Southeast region than, than any other region. And then, of course, um, yellowtails. Uh, yellowtail snapper in the Keys and Southwest. So one thing we're interested in doing is, is seeing what proportion of respondents are experiencing depredation uh, by target species complex. So here they are again, the same color as you saw earlier. And one thing you'll see is we kind of made this group, uh, deep water snapper grouper, just because a lot of these folks were kind of using somewhat unique ways to catch these fish, deep dropping, electric reels, and so on. Uh, we didn't get a ton of respondents there, but every single one uh, has experienced depredation, uh, very high levels of depredation in HMS pelagics, uh, as well as dolphin wahoo and tuna, and then uh, snapper groupers still up there above you know 60%, and 
as well as uh, CMPs or coastal migratory pelagics. But as you get inshore, you're seeing a bit, you know, less of a, um, you know, uh, proportion of respondents experiencing depredation. So I think some of this has to do as well with just the, the styles of these fisheries. So, you know, if you look at it from left to right, these tend to be fish that are, um, you know, further and further from the vessel potentially as they're being la as they're initially being caught. So it takes longer to land them. Uh, you know, some of them fight harder and so on and so forth. So this could be a reflection of that, uh, but we need to look at the rest of the data still. Asking fishermen, you know, what they perceive as the uh, most important depredator. This is uh, showing you a word cloud. It's actually semi-quantitative. So the size of the letters correspond to uh, the number of, of responses. So you can clearly see bull uh, for bull shark as the number one uh, you know, species being reported. And this is now, this is outside of the, the, the sportsman uh, focus group. This is now statewide. So we're encompassing, you know, many more fishermen um, than the Facebook group was identifying. So that those things seem to be very consistent. Now, perceptions of depredation, uh, this is sort of a second pass of the of the survey so um, not everyone elected to do this uh, but we did have a substantial number of respondents and what you're seeing now is is what people feel depredation and how, how it's trended in the last five years so on the right here uh, slightly increased to increased um, the same in the middle and then these are uh, slightly decreased and decreased so you can see the majority of folks if you stack this yellow bar on top of this uh, green bar, uh, feel that this has increased over the last five years. Uh, interestingly, though, there is a significant portion of the population, at least the recreational fishing population, uh, that perceive this to have uh, remained the same. And uh, there's lower uh, proportions of, of folks that think that this has uh, decreased. Uh, this becomes more interesting when you break it up by sector. Uh, again, we were very much biased by uh, the recreational boat uh, respondents, folks who engage in fisheries that way. Um, if you look on this set side of the, of the chart, uh, you're seeing our charter for hire, commercial and headboat. You can see that these have higher and larger sizes of yellow bars as well as green. Uh, you can see there's a lot of consensus here uh, that the depredation has increased in the past five years by these individuals. So uh, again, you know, the, the sample sizes are smaller, uh, but we are seeing uh, some of the some of those uh, consistent trends out there. And on the reverse side, if you look at the recreational fishery, you can see uh, there's a lot less folks uh, who think that this has increased, uh, but it's certainly still there. One question we ask is, you know, how does the potential for depredation influence how often you go fishing. And uh, you can see uh, overwhelmingly here, uh, this, this seems to have no effect. So uh, over 80% of the respondents um, you know, don't change their behavior based on the potential for depredation. Uh, however, when it does happen, uh, we did find that about 90% of these fishermen altered their fishing practices. And that was really broken up between changing locations, so over half of those individuals uh, or a third of them uh, just stopped fishing for the day. So now linking this back to conservation measures, you can see folks who do experience depredation uh, are clearly less willing uh, to support um, shark conservation initiatives. So this, this comes as no surprise. This confirms uh, a lot of work that Marcus has done in the past uh, he's targeted uh, particularly shore-based fishermen, and he he's found a lot of this, uh, some congruence between what the patterns we're seeing here uh, as well as there. And this is sort of the same graph, but again, we're breaking it up by sector. So in the black box, these are, you know, folks who are um, a little more reliant, a lot more reliant on the, um, on fishing as a, as a, you know, as employment, so you know, you're seeing much stronger opposition um, in the commercial sector. But again, you know, our, our samples are, are relatively low. Uh, but you know, similarly stronger opposition to support conservation uh, in charter for hire. Uh, but you know, it is it is relatively mixed. So it's important to also state that you know this isn't a a, a one-off or sorry a, a unanimous type of sentiment. 
Okay, so I'm going to get into the, the third and final segment of our work, uh, which is partnering with and training uh, captains to help us swing, swab remains of depredated fish. And this is something that uh, Marcus and colleagues uh, kind of developed proof of concept for a few years ago. Uh, they were working with uh, a bottom longline uh, type of, of, of fishery, or in their case, it was a, a research bottom longline, but uh, they developed the proof of concept that they could, you know, swab fish uh, and get DNA from things that have depredated them, uh, and they were able to validate that because they were also catching um, the uh, the sharks on those long lines too. And since that paper, uh, this has started to gain a lot of traction. Uh, these are just you know, a few of of several um, uh, studies that have come out uh, looking at this using molecular tools, so swabbing those bite wounds for DNA. Uh, so this is, you know, gained some traction off of Western Australia um, and even the Marianas. So this was a, a paper that came out uh, this past year where they actually, in addition to just, you know, doing DNA identification, they showed that they could provide kits to uh, trained fishermen uh, who could really uh, play an important role in acquiring those samples and they were very successful. So our goal with respect to this project has been to uh, acquire uh, swab samples from about 100 reef fish and 100 pelagic fish and uh, understand and obviously identify those those predators based on molecular techniques and uh, trying to do this throughout the year so we can get some sense of potentially how the depredator community, if you will, uh, might be changing uh, as we go through different seasons. Uh, again, this is really important uh, because we're involving the stakeholders in our data collection and co-producing that knowledge of what's damaging these potential fisheries. So these are just a, a smattering of, of some of our fishing partners. Uh, so we've been working uh, from Sebastian, Florida, down to Stewart, Florida. So this is uh, what we call the Treasure Coast region of the Atlantic coast of Florida. Uh, so just uh, some photos from their websites and uh, you know showing you uh, the different types of species they catch. These are primarily snapper grouper species. We have uh, had some individuals um, who target, uh, you know, based on time of year, coastal migratory pelagics like kings and as well as dolphin and wahoo. And we, we have been getting um, uh, some sampling kits out to those individuals as well. So when we've advertised, uh, you know, for this this type of project, you know, we, we recruit these fishermen and then we uh, will take a, a charter with them and then we provide them with this sort of um, infographic card uh, that helps, you know, keep it simple and, uh, you know, takes them through the process of what it is to, uh, you know, do this sort of forensic analysis. So um, some of our feedback has been really, really strong on this and it's a relatively simple process. So we provide these individuals with all the materials they need. Uh, we give them a, uh, you know, a data card um, you know, we have them take a photograph of the of the uh, depredated fish carcass, and then they kind of put everything into a bag for us um, and call us when they're ready. And they can also even um, scan a uh, this sort of QR QR code, um, which will take them to a, a place to upload a photo, so we can kind of validate what's going on and uh, and so what have you. So this is a an infographic uh, developed by Marcus's group as has been very effective. So, so far we've had uh, about 40 swabs collected from uh, 30 specimens. So we're we're double swabbing a little bit to ensure that we're getting enough DNA and that, that has been showing uh, to work well. Uh, so far we've, we've uh, successfully sequenced about 15 specimens and that number is gonna go up because we've identified a, a, a step in the sequencing process that gives us a better confirmation so that's been uh, very very promising and we've identified uh, about six species so far depredators so uh, consistent with some of the other trends we've been seeing uh, bull sharks have been most commonly identified uh, from these carcasses uh, we have had uh, some sandbars as well as lemon sharks uh, silkies um, a uh, sharp nose uh, which we're still uh, a little bit unsure about but we're um, getting some verification on that, as well as uh, one uh, great hammerhead. So uh, these are kind of the, the species, again, that have all been reported 
in the other uh, components of the, of the project too. So just to wrap this up a little bit, uh, we're seeing bull sharks as a primary depredator that's been seen uh, across the board on the surveys, the swab analysis, and what folks are reporting on the social media site. Uh, Snapper Grouper and HMS Fisheries are, are clearly being uh, affected by this. Uh, you know, to what degree, we're, we're not quite sure yet, but uh, we are starting to get some of the first information on these depredation rates. And some appear to be, you know, much higher than others. So, you know, that's important to keep in mind uh, moving forward. Uh, but there are clearly differences in, in perception of depredation. It really depends on the user groups. We're seeing a lot of differences, of course, between people who make their living on the water versus, you know, folks who are uh, a bit more, you know, uncommonly on the water and not and just fishing recreationally. Our swab analysis is is clearly ongoing. You know, we're we're, we're well short of our our target goal of about 200 uh, samples. So uh, we'll be ramping that up in the last phase of the project here. And uh, one thing we started doing was was uh, hopping aboard some of these charters so we can uh, further quantify uh, depredation rates. You know, it's a lot to ask the charter captains. You know, already you know to do the swab analysis and all these other things and. Oftentimes, uh, these individuals are also, you know, trying to manage um, their their um, their crew and their customers. So uh, we kind of made the decision to to hop aboard and and really uh, get at some of these depredation rates um, ourselves, obviously in in collaboration with those fishermen. And clearly, this is a complex problem. It's going to require uh, some innovation solutions. Uh, and in that sort of vein, uh, just a quick mention of our, our new NOAA uh, BREP project. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with BREP, this is the Bycatch Reduction and Engineering Program. And we're uh, testing uh, at, at scale some of these uh, shark bands, uh, Zeppelins. So these are magnetic deterrents that are designed primarily for bottom fishing. And they are uh, designed to basically serve as terminal tackle um, and in the process of, you know, bringing your bait down to the bottom, also, uh, you know, keep sharks or purportedly keep sharks off of these fish. So there's, there's been quite a bit of testing on this in Australia, um, which has shown some, some measurable success. I think, you know, it's, it, it's certainly showing it's, it's making it more difficult for those uh, predators to um, get to these uh, struggling fish. Uh, it doesn't, you know, 100% stop this or prevent it, but uh, I think anything we can do at this point in time would be would be helpful. Um, and this this graph here is actually showing you some some work we were doing. Uh, we're actually quantifying the mag magnetic field, the footprint, if you will, of that. And, and the whole point there is it's supposed to overwhelm the sensory system of these sharks, which is very sensitive actually, and in in so doing. We'll keep them off of these uh, struggling fish. So we're trying to, you know, marry our findings on on the magnetic footprint uh, with how we might, um, you know, propose uh, these gear configurations to um, achieve the highest effectiveness and deterring depredation. So uh, in closing, I just want to really thank our fishing partners. This would not be possible without them. In particular, uh, Pat Price, I rest in peace. Uh, his legacy still continues here. Uh, these are some of our uh, captains who've really stepped up for us, uh, as well as uh, the folks on the sportsman page, particularly Captain Doug Coven, uh, Robert Fly Navarro, and Jason Paquin. They've been really um, accommodating uh, for us to you know, peer into what they're experiencing and sharing that knowledge. So I really uh, respect their um, accommodation. And just uh, to acknowledge our funding sources. Most of the work I presented to you today has been supported by the NOAA Fisheries Cooperative Research Program. And uh, like I said, moving forward into next year, we'll be uh, shifting gears and uh, uh, working on our, our BREP, uh, so the bycatch reduction engineering grant, uh, which we just started. So uh, keep in touch with us. This is our contact information on our Twitter and uh, Instagram handles. We have a Facebook page. Um, our lab webpage is fisheco.org, and uh, you can do that. You keep in touch with us and uh, keep abreast of the various um, 
changes and findings that we're we're going to be gaining with the, these projects. So, with that, I'll say thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll open up for questions. And I'll turn my screen on. All right. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, um, Matt. I'm going to take control from you again, just to um, go over how to use the webinar real quick. Just a reminder on how to use the webinar. You can uh, raise your hand by clicking on the kind of turkey icon. If it's green, that means your hand is not raised. Um, in order to raise your hand, it should turn red. Um, and once we see your hand raised, I'll unmute you and you'll hear you're unmuted by the, um, by the software. And uh, make sure your microphone is green. That indicates that you've unmuted there on your uh, end of the webinar. You can also type a question into the question box. Um, so with that, are there any questions? Doug Coven, I see your hand is raised. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hey Matt. <laughs> hey Doug, how are you? Great, great presentation. Um, thanks for everything you do. Uh, I don't want to say this is off topic, but something that's been on my mind. Um, one of the issues that when I've had this discussion about depredation is it seems that the value put on sharks is greatly outweighs the value put on all other species of fish. And um, had we been talking about, say, barracuda depredation, uh, I don't think we would be here right now. I think they'd say, well, go catch some bar catch more barracudas. But um, because the value of sharks is so great, uh, one of the, the things that every time we have this discussion, which, which and when someone, uh, a, a, a opponent of ours, uh, so to speak, is that sharks are so necessary because without sharks, I've heard everything from, you know, there'll be no oxygen in the water to, uh, the coral reefs will die um, to sharks help keep the, the most common thing I hear is that sharks keep other fish populations in check. And uh, lately I've just been hearing a lot of that. And you, who much smarter than me, maybe you can answer this. Um, if that really doesn't make any sense to me because, I mean, that's basically saying without sharks, there would be too many snappers and groupers and tunas for us. Um, and so that, that that kind of blows my mind. And and that's like the biggest answer. And I think that's one of the issues that we have, like I said, is that there puts so much value on sharks, where, um, as you know, a lot of us sport fishermen look at sharks as just another fish. Um, and we think that the value that sharks should have is that they can be eaten and caught for food not that they keep oceans clean, which I, I, you read books about it and everyone publishes papers about it, but it doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. And I, uh, the longer I spend on the water, the more I disagree with that. Let's figure out how to bring that up and ask your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, like, look, they've been around for, you know, <laughs> hundreds of millions of years, right? So, you know, we, we tend to think that, you know, they're, a representative component of an ecosystem, right? So, you know, the research uh, that has been done to show, you know, the ecological importance of sharks, which I think is what you're referring right. to, mm -hmm. um, has, you know, shown it, it, in certain situations, you know, you can, uh, if you don't have sharks around, you know, other things get out of balance and, and so on and so forth. It, it, it depends on the situation and where, and, and that's been very difficult to demonstrate, I think. Um, you know, clearly in South Florida, as you know, there's there's other um, economic importance of sharks, you know, with the, uh, the I guess, right. the ecotourism industry and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think there are kind of subtle, several, but very subtle reasons as to why you know those animals belong in the ecosystem um you know and and i you know what's interesting and marcus might have some 
some input on this is, you know, I think some of these interactions that we're seeing, you know, between uh, fishing activities and sharks, you know, most of the time it's not really what they're always eating, right? This is sort of a, an artificial um, interaction to some degree. So, you know, I think if you were to look at the stomach contents of, of bull sharks, for example, right? Like, um, my knowledge is from the younger animals, right? Because they're a much easier abundant supply and you can look and see what they're eating. You know, most of what they're eating is, is, is catfish and mullet and things like that, right? So as we know, you know, there's quite a big mullet run that, you know, supports other, other fisheries and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, that's, that's just one example, but, you know, maybe Marcus has um, uh, something he wants to say. Are you there, Marcus? I am, yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Well, first of all, Doug, hi, I'm Marcus. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, and, and before, let me just throw something up. The, one of the reasons I brought this up, too, is because the last NOAA presentation, um, the last webinar I watched, they start the whole presentation with, oh, of course, we need, you know, uh, the popular sharks needs to be at this because without them, uh, other fish populations would die out. And they had this blanket statement that was so, and that was the basis of their whole webinar, you know, and they put it out there and I was in the background, like, what are they talking about? You know, because uh, we, you know, human beings keep snapper and grouper and other fish populations in check by catching them, I feel. So, yeah, uh, Doug, you know, a, a couple of thoughts on that. This is Marcus Dryman. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that what you're saying is what we're hearing from so many fishermen that they feel like um, sharks have been over prioritized and that they've been protected at the expense of other species. So just a first off, an acknowledgement that what you're saying, we are hearing consistently. OK, that's not just you saying that we're hearing that from a lot of folks. Secondly, I just want to clarify that when scientists or ecologists talk about the ecological importance of sharks, we're talking about that in pristine systems, right? in virgin ecosystems. And the truth is, um, no one would argue that we have all altered our ecosystem via fishing pressure, via artificial structures, um, and in this case, via provisioning. So we are now, we have fundamentally changed the system. Um, and just like Matt said, you know, it's not a natural component of these sharks' diets to feed exclusively on, on billfish and, and uh, you know, big red snapper and things like that. So they're changing behaviors in response to how we've altered our ecosystem. So that's something that I think that's important to sort to sort of keep in mind. But again, I mean, I, I think my final thought on this is that what you're saying is at the heart of why this issue is so contentious, because on the water fishermen, folks that spend their lives on the water are all saying, man, this depredation thing has gotten crazy. Um, and they don't feel like there have been adequate measures taken to, um, to alleviate that problem, right? So that that's at the heart of what we're trying to do, both Matt and myself. Um, and so, you know, it's important for us to all remember that we're actually going for the same outcome here, um, just acknowledging that the problem is extremely complex. Yeah. Mm. Well, so keep up the works, guys. I'll let someone else ask a question. Thanks for everything that you do. Thanks, Doug. All right. The next question is Mike Schmicke. Thanks, Chip, and thanks, Matt, for the presentation. Um, I've got two quick questions. Uh, the first one, um, and this may be a general, you know, fisherman observation type thing, but does depredation typically occur? Uh, I'm thinking mostly of snapper grouper uh, species that you would drop for. Does the depredation typically occur during the ascent, so while they're coming up to the surface, or after they are kind of near and on the surface, or is it kind of a mixture of both? That's a great question. Um, and Marcus actually has a study that addressed the latter, um, sort of when fish are being released. And but for our purposes here, and I, I probably should have specified this, We've been focusing mainly on instances in which fish are getting bitten before um, they're getting to the angler. 
if that makes sense. So uh, I think it does happen, uh, you know, on, on various uh, sides of that. But Marcus, uh, you guys did a study uh, looking at that a little bit, right? Release uh, mortality. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good question. You know, the, the idea of that if we're going to encourage anglers to release undesirable fish or fish that are out of season or too small or whatnot, and we want to promote best practices that include descending devices and things like that, we better be sure that we can assure them that the chances are much lower for that fish to be gobbled up by a shark or a dolphin once it's descended. And our work has shown that that is very much the case. Um, these fish are rarely depredated on the way down um, via descenders or, or other types of devices. So that's uh, that's one step, at least in understanding the nature of this interaction. But it also gives us insight into what makes a shark depredate something in the first place. Because really, to the shark, what's the difference if the fish is on the way down or on the way up? Um, and we think it has something to do with the swimming behavior. But those are questions that we're interested in continuing to try to figure out. Thanks. And it got, I guess it got, that response got kind of close to what I was looking for, but I guess I'm thinking more in the sense of not necessarily, not necessarily on the release, but when the fish, you know, you fish is coming up from depth, you can kind of see color, it's coming up to the surface, but you haven't brought it into the boat. Is that a point when depredation would typically occur? And I'm, I'm wondering for the purposes of if the fish gets up off the bottom and it gets past a certain point. Is it kind of home free at that point, or are, are, is there still, you know, a higher, you know, a similarly high risk of depredation when it's near the surface? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's situationally dependent. I've been out on charters who, you know, they say sometimes these sharks are just hanging right under the hull of the boat, right? And, you know, in that case, they're they're fine until they get, to, you know, close to the boat. So. Uh, and then in other cases, we, as you saw, hopefully on the video, uh, you know, this is happening at depth far away. So it kind of depends on the situation, depends on the habitat, potentially the shark's behavior. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it spans the continuum of possibilities, I guess, Mike. All right, thanks. And then the, the, Second question was, did you look at any differences by gear and how that may have affected depredation? I'm thinking specifically in terms of an electric versus a manual reel. Um, if an electric reel is bringing a fish in faster, does that reduce the possibility of depredation or does it not really have much of an effect? Yeah, we haven't looked that far into it. Um, we have, as maybe you, you saw us, how we categorize it by complex and in that we, we tried to uh, focus on species that were more likely to be caught on a, an electric reel or that type of thing so uh, our our data is honestly weak in that regard we, we didn't really capture it but it, it's definitely a, a valid uh, question uh, moving forward all right that's all I had thank you thank you hey David Sosa has a question. David, it's showing you're still muted on your side. If you click on the red microphone. Uh, you, um, it should look like a red microphone. Yeah, it's still showing that you're self-muted. If you want to enter a question, you can type it into the question box if you want. While we're waiting on David's question, I was wondering, um, if you noticed any impact in the results of maybe somebody that's been fishing longer, um, having been around for a little bit longer, do they tend to have different perceptions of somebody that's kind of just started in the fishery? Yeah, we're, we're eager to get to that as well, Chip. Uh, we just unfortunately haven't had the opportunity to analyze the data in that 
regard just yet, but we're we're going to get there, and we're we're very interested in, in what that's going to show. All right, all right. David has entered the question. Let me find it real quick. Have you guys done any studies on the impact of shark feeding ecotours on shark behavior? No, um, and thank you for your question, uh, David. Uh, that's obviously a very popular um, piece here in, in South Florida, Southeast Florida in particular. Uh, there's, there's several different uh, outfits doing that. Um, uh, my hypothesis is that there's, there's some relationship, I just don't know what, um, you know, so, it would take a bit more uh, delving and maybe some some more monitoring of what's going on. But you know, I know uh, a lot of the fishermen in this region uh, do do seem to think that that has a major effect uh, on shark depredation. At the same time, uh, you can see uh, you know in these data sets that are kind of more regional that we're seeing some higher prevalence of, of shark depredation. You know, commercial fisheries, uh, obviously recreational fisheries too. So. Um, you know, there's there's a potential interaction there. It may, um, you know, uh, amplify those interactions. Um, and Marcus, do you have any input on that one? Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I do. Um, so there, there's some pretty limited evidence, but it's it's strong evidence nonetheless that comes out of Australia that suggests that there are these learned effects, right? In, in a pretty elegant way, um, those Aussies have shown that. So basically fishing in an area that's open to the public repeatedly um, and timing how quickly the sharks became depredators in that instance and then comparing that to fishing in an area that's closed to fishing an mpa um, and what they demonstrated very clearly is that it took the sharks a lot longer to become depredators in that mpa because they they hadn't been habituated in the same way that they had been in the area outside of the mpa and that's, I, I should have better explained it um, when I was speaking with Doug a minute ago, answering Doug's question. That's kind of what I'm getting at here is there's a lot of behavioral aspects to this that are just so difficult to deal with. Um, and so that's something we're really struggling with, but I think you and probably any other fisherman on the call um, would agree that there are some, some learned aspects to this behavior for sure. Yeah, and staff from uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife had indicated uh, from their study on depredation, they found more experienced long-term fishers across commercial, charter, and recreational anglers had the most negative sen uh, sentiments towards uh, predators uh, responsible for depredation and were more likely to see an increase in depredation. All right. Any other questions or comments? I think this is a really good discussion. I'd like to keep it going while we have their time. Well, I am not seeing any other questions. Um, so given that, I want to say thank you uh, for a great presentation today. And then for everybody that's online, we will be posting uh, a recording of this presentation on our uh, seminar series webpage. Uh, if you know individuals that might be interested in it, you can share it with them and they can watch it at, at their leisure. And it was a, a great honor to hear about this presentation. And thank you guys so much. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here, guys. All right. Everyone have a good afternoon. All right. Take care.